Hi, I'm Josh Heald, and welcome back to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Hi, I'm John Hurwitz, and welcome back to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Josh Heald, John Hurwitz, welcome back to The Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you both today? We're great. Very well, thank you. you. I'm really excited to have you both back on my show today. First of all, congratulations on the success of Cobra Kai Season 4, another amazing series that went to number one around the world. How pleased are you with the reaction and the success it's had? Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, you know, we you, you've been talking to us since uh, the YouTube days. Uh, and even back then, we uh, we loved the reaction the show was getting and, and meeting fans from all over the world. Uh, but as soon as it went to Netflix, everything uh, blew up in a whole other way uh, for for the it, you know, people are finding the show every day uh, on that platform. And when season four came out, it was uh really special for all of us to, you know, we had, we had made the show. We, there were all these things that we were excited for fans to see and to see people just devouring it right away, binging through it and being able to engage with us and, and talk about uh, this universe that we love uh, so much has been a really fun last few weeks. Absolutely. And I've loved every second of it. And so season four starts with the return of Terry Silver. So let's do the same. What was it like finally having him back on set? Was Thomas Ian Griffith reluctant or excited to get back to this character after so many years? He was in tremendous shape. His kicks were amazing, by the way. He was amazing uh, and is amazing and continues to be amazing every step of the way through the process. You know, he's a writer like we are. And, uh, you know, that you you speak a, a language with fellow writers where you can talk about story in a way that's uh, that's different than you um, would talk about, some, you know, with somebody who doesn't spend all day, you know, on a final draft page trying to trying to <laughs> fix a script. Uh, so he had some questions for us. We had lots of answers and we had questions for him and he had lots of answers and uh, we were fortunate that yeah he's in tremendous shape he's uh, he's never uh, gotten out of shape he's continued his martial arts training his whole life um, he is um, a writer's writer and an actor's actor and puts in the work and um, every day he showed up on set there was uh, you know he brought it there's an energy he brings to that character uh, in particular and some choices he makes that uh, we wholly support and uh, it just was, it was everything we could have wanted out of bringing Terry Silver into this universe that he would go all in and, and show these new colors and these new sides to this character that we were writing for him. I love that early on, Terry acknowledges that he terrorized a teenager back in Karate Kid 3. When he apologizes to Daniel in that garden scene, was that sincere, do you think, to start with? You know, we believe it was sincere. I think that's the thing that's fun on the show is, you know, there are characters that you're rooting for. You're rooting for most of the characters on the show in one way or another. When you're with them and you're in their heads, you're rooting for them, but they're not seeing what the other characters are going through. So Daniel LaRusso is right, given his experience, to be very skeptical skeptical of this guy who is basically a con artist in his childhood. He's a teenager and this, you know, adult man comes into his world, befriends him, and it was all a ruse and, and a ruse that was designed for him to get hurt. Um, so he was terrorized by this guy. So, you know, in our minds, the Terry Silver that we that you start with at the beginning of season four is a guy who has worked on himself and has left all of this in the past and has reflected on the, the mistakes that he made. But, you know, when when, uh, you know, he, he shows up in the, in Miyagi-Do and Daniel reacts the way that he does, you know, it can't help but irk him just enough. Like th there's something about this guy that's getting under his skin and the, his competitive spirit comes out there. And he's uh, from that moment on, he's ready to take him on. But his plan is to take him on on the mat. And, you know, you see where it goes from there. We really do. And let's talk a bit about the actual production of season four. When did it start filming? How long did it take? How much training was there to do? Because in season four, the students are also becoming experts with weapons as well. Yeah, we had a big uh, break between filming season three and season four, um, you know, with the platform move and with the pandemic, um, you know, plopping in the middle of our, um, you know, process there. But mm. uh, so the, the season started filming in January of 2021 and we wrapped uh, right at the um, end of April 2021, maybe, maybe the first uh, week of May. Um, you know, we, 
we asked a lot of our performers, uh, both in the production season and the off season to, you know, stay loose and don't hurt themselves. And if they have a technique that uh, they're working on on the show, it would be nice if they continue to, you know, to flex that muscle. But really, it happens during production. I mean, from the moment we, you know, show up on set, if an actor is not working and they have a big stunt or a big piece of choreography coming up, they're constantly, you know, in the gym or in the stunt facility uh, working with uh, our amazing stunt team on perfecting those things. Mary Mouser, you know, had two sides in her hand from, you know, the first week of production. Um, and you see it start to happen, you know, in the later episodes, and then you see the culmination of, um, you know, what, what, what she does with those when you get to the tournament. But um, it's just a, from the moment you get there, everyone's putting their heads down and working, whether the camera's on or not. And so in season four, after being scared of Tori for so long, Sam really goes after her and Amanda does too. I think that Tori showed tremendous restraint in waiting mostly for the tournament. Do you think it's showing more sides of her character this season? Yeah, you know, we wanted to get underneath the surface with Tori. Um, you know, we've touched upon it in earlier seasons a little bit about the challenges she has in her home life. Uh, but, you know, there wasn't quite the real estate to be as three-dimensional as we wanted to in earlier seasons. So this was a year where, you know, we had seen her attack Sam at school and attack, the, uh, you know, break into the LaRusso house and, and attack. And we wanted to know, well, what brings... Um, you know, a young person to be ready to do those sorts of things and to have that anger that she has inside. And you see the tough life that she has, you know, on the flip side, you know, it's easy to, to, you know, watch and we're seeing Tori's, you know, tough situation going on. Uh, but Samantha LaRusso is not, I mean, imagine that, you know, you're on your first day of school and a girl gets on the uh, loudspeaker and calls you out and threatens you and says, I'm coming for you, bitch. And then like you have that whole fight, which results in tragedy with what happened to Miguel. And then not, you know, a few months later, this girl's breaking into your home and attacking you. So I think Sam LaRusso is a hundred percent justified to not, to be very skeptical of this girl, to not feel like, um, you know, ready to forgive and to be ready to sort of you know, uh, set her own terms when Tori ends up, uh, you know, going to school. That doesn't mean the audience is going to necessarily feel that way because we're seeing the full picture as an audience. But, you know, it's that's the fun of the show. You know, Amanda, you brought up Amanda. That Amanda Tori relationship is one of our favorites uh, from season four. Yeah, and too. it's Amanda starts that season ready to, you know, kill Tori. Like she's like this. This girl has been terrorizing my daughter. But as she gets to know her, she realizes some of the challenges that this girl has and she's looking for some, some solution that's outside of these karate wars. How can we end this, put an end to this? And maybe it is, you know, reaching out as opposed to attacking. And Kenny was a great new addition to the show this season. And I loved his arc with Anthony as well. But can you tell me this? How did Anthony get all of that milk inside of his locker? <laughs> That's uh, that's a trade secret that uh, I don't know if we're prepared <laughs> to divulge. It's so funny. That's that's something we talked about from the start with our uh, you know with our special effects team um, in terms of how much milk we wanted to see in that locker, and we really made it clear we wanted to see as much milk as could fit in that locker as you know blood could fit in the elevator of The Shining. And, you know, it was, if you just keep asking and don't take no for an answer, you can get a, an effect like that. You know, it was, it was a, a head scratcher for them in terms of what the practicality of it is. Um, but it's, uh, it, seeing it on the day was one of the most joyful moments on the show. Just the culmination of actually opening up that locker and triggering that, you know, deluge. Uh, it was, I don't know how... Anthony and his friends actually did it, but um, I think there's an engineering grant in their future, perhaps. <laughs> uh, we're in the same boat as the principal. That, that was our favorite thing <laughs> in the callback where we had the principal ask the question that you just asked. It's, <laughs> we, when, it, when we filmed it, we're like, how did a bunch of kids do this? And we're like, okay, well, let's, let's point it out how ridiculous that was. They should be going to MIT. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's their, you know, that's their entrance exam right there. Exactly. Another thing I really loved about season four was Johnny starts learning Miyagi Day. Daniel tries to understand Eagle Fang. How fun were those scenes to film? It was the best. That, that's that's the fan fiction right there. That's, you know, childhood us being there in the Miyagi Do backyard as 
Johnny is going through the paces that Daniel had gone through and you're finding the comedy with, with that and slowly see him starting to make some progress only to fall into the pond. So that was amazing. And then, you know, uh, that Eagle Fang set that we had um, that, that abandoned, you know, factory uh, is one of our favorite locations that we have. And to have, you know, Johnny in his like hyper-masculine kind of way, you know, teaching Daniel what it is to be a man, like, you know, it, it, it was a, it was a, a ridiculous kind of uh, thing to witness, you know, that, that uh, classic eighties machismo and D- D- Daniel LaRusso, like, you know, trying to embrace it. It was really funny. So everything culminates with the two of them finally having an official rematch from the original Karate Kid. I think that it ending in a draw was the best possible resolution for the both characters. It kept them both in a good place with one not holding a victory over the other. Did you consider one of them winning or the other one in different ways that could go? I don't think we ever really considered uh, either one of them winning outright. We knew that this was uh, a story moment where they were both at a point of complete um, frustration and stubbornness with each other and um, immobility in regards to their own karate philosophies. And we didn't want to give either one of those philosophies um, a notch on the other. We, you know, continue to want to present, you know, both of these uh, roads as valuable and both of these philosophies as necessary. And um, it was only fitting that it would end you know, in, in a draw. And you would hope that there's some universe where that's the moment that they look at each other and realize, you know, that, that there's some value here, but, you know, unfortunately the, the Eli thing came on top of that and that compounded the problems. But yeah, from the get go, it was, uh, you know, you guys are going to have an actual tournament style rematch here. It comes, you know, 30 something years in the making. Um, but, uh, it's, you know, it's an easier pill to swallow if they both know that, you know, they're not going to lose. Now, Johnny is notoriously safety conscious, so he takes all the students up onto a building and persuades Samantha LaRusso to jump across to another one. Can you tell me, did you use a stunt double? Did you use a stunt building? How did you film that scene? We had we had stunt doubles up there. We actually had all of the kids jump across in, oh, really? in one way or another, and we ended up trimming it down because we felt story-wise it worked best for Samantha to have that big moment. Mm. But yeah, no, we were it was on actual roofs. There was... Uh, major rigging going on um our stunt team went above and beyond and it was uh it was you know it was it's it's scary up there it, you know it was johnny like you said johnny uh uh you know will put he throws kids into a cement mixer so why not have them jump from one uh one roof to another um but you know uh the the actors and the stunt performers all came together and it, we think it turned out to be a really fun sequence it, really it was, was also really cold and really icy up there. So it added to the, yeah. the actual danger of, of shooting and the extra safety precautions that were taken. But um, but yeah, our director for that episode, Mariel Woods, and our stunt team did an amazing job. They they had a vision that they presented to us of doing kind of a born identity shot where the, the camera goes, you know, over with uh, with the stunt performer and we were able to achieve that. So it was amazing. I love how when Robbie joins Cobra Kai, he still really values everything that he learned with Miyagi Day. And it seems that he doesn't have a no mercy mentality. Do you think he could be on a similar trajectory to Johnny and that he's very much redeemable and could be a sensei perhaps in the future even? I think every character on the show, you know, we at this point, it's, you know, the secret sauce is out there. We we try to present everybody as potentially redeemable, even the most irredeemable characters have moments where you see, you know, a little crack in their armor. You know, Kreese has a, a moment in season four where you start to see like, wait a minute, was that something, <laughs> you know, nice coming from, you know, Darth Vader? And uh, so, so I think, we, you know, we try to constantly show the, the flip side of, of what a character is experiencing and try to present a bad character um, as somebody's point of view of that character as much as we can. You know, that there, there are some characters on the show that are, you know, repetitively mean. And, uh, you know, maybe we just haven't gotten around to, uh, you know, glimpsing behind the curtain there yet. But uh, almost entirely, uh, everybody has the potential to be redeemed and to be a sensei someday. Absolutely. And so I'm going to jump straight to my biggest question for season four and perhaps of all of it so far. After his confrontation with Amanda, did Chris pay for that honey crisp apple? 
No, he did not. He's he's uh, you know, this is a man who's committed some major crimes on our series. Uh, you know, he threw Daniel LaRusso through a window. Uh, you know, he's he's not afraid to assault people. Stealing an apple is, uh, you know, just one of his uh, one of the many crimes that he's uh, he's committed on our show. But uh, it was delicious. I can tell you that. I was shocked when I went back and watched the season for a second time. I definitely confirmed he walked out of that store. He walked past the cashier. He had no intention of paying for it. Not, not <laughs> even for a second. He has so, a very liberal samples policy. <laughs> So one person I was delighted to see return to the show was Nicole Brown. We got to catch up with her and how she's doing. Was it fun to bring her back? It was super fun. It was great. It was a it was like a nice breath of fresh air. You know, when uh, you know, when Nicole's character left the show, um, we had always intended to find a way of continuing to tie that character into the universe. And uh, it was um, just a nice day to, to, to put these two characters that were there at the start of the show. And, you know, you have this this deep childhood friendship to to draw upon and to rely upon for, you know, a moment of clarity for um, for Sam as she's kind of looking for her path forward. And, you know, it's the subversion of that being that, you know, she takes from that an, an aggressive attitude um, as, as the takeaway. Um, but um, but yeah, it was just a it was a nice little throwback day where you have two characters talking on a couch. And, you know, we rarely have that on this show with so much. Uh, you know, punching and kicking and throwing through windows and everything else. It's very true. And Julia Macchio was an amazing addition as cousin Vanessa. Was Ralph excited to be sharing scenes with his real life daughter? Oh, he was thrilled. It was one of those things, you know, we, we've gotten to know Julia since season one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she and the family have visited set and she's the, like the sweetest person in the world and extremely talented. So, you know, we always had in our in the back of our minds, it would be fun to surprise Ralph and surprise her with an opportunity for her to appear on the show. And uh, when we found that that character, you know, having Louis's sister felt like it would be a real fun opportunity. And specifically, we really enjoyed having it where she's sharing a scene with Daniel and she's criticizing his parenting. (laughs) <laughs> because they, their their relationship could not be further from that dynamic in the sense that she, there's almost there's just a hundred percent love there. Ralph Macchio is one of the the greatest fathers I've ever known. Uh, his relationship with his children is so wonderful and so special, and you feel the love every single moment. Uh, so to have her come on the show and be challenging Daniel Larusso's parenting skills felt like a, a fun little twist. Yeah, I love that. And hopefully we get to see more interactions with them in the future. She's an amazing actress. Now I want to go on to the two-part season finale, the All Valley Tournament. But to start with, I was so surprised when Carrie Underwood made an appearance. Can you tell me how that came about? Is she a fan of the show? She is a fan of the show. Uh, you know, she had tweeted her uh, love and enjoyment of the show when it moved to uh, Netflix. Um, and, you know, we... We file all those moments away um, to, you know, say, oh, okay, you know, like, I, you know, if we ever get to a place where this type of story presents itself, um, you know, it's nice to know that you have uh, a fan on the other side of that conversation. And as it happened, we did have this story that we wanted to tell um, about the minutia of this, you know, these people who put on these tournaments and, you know, they deal with parking garages and food service and they argue over the, the smallest little insignificant things. And we wanted to just present what a seemingly throwaway moment of, you know, just past failures of, you know, one example being trying to get Malcolm Jamal Warner to show up and, you know, clearly he didn't come or something bad <laughs> happened. And, and you just know that they're not capable of, you know, swinging for the fence and actually hitting the ball anywhere near the fence. And <laughs> when Ron is able to not only, you know, pull it off, but, you know, succeed with this, you know, superstar level, uh, you know, personality who can come on and uh, do this performance. It was such an amazing, um, you know, moment to write to and such a thrill for us when she said yes. And to be able to take this song from the Karate Kid and present it in a new light with a new recording and a new arrangement by, uh, you know, that she did with our uh, composer, Zach and Leo. Uh, it just it brought everything into fruition. It was one of the easiest days of filming we've ever had because she's such a professional and it was, you know, you're just you're getting to attend the Carrie Underwood concert. It was uh, it was incredible. Can you tell me then in the Miyagi verse, 
does this song, The Moment of Truth, exist before she sang it? Or does everyone there think it's her song? Or could they actually hear the end credits when they're playing over the first movie? <laughs> that is a really complex question. Um, <laughs> I believe I believe that that song existed in that world. Uh, maybe, am I, what do you think, Josh? I mean, well, I, I don't think anyone on screen had ever heard that song because they've never, they've never heard the, uh, they've never seen The Karate Kid because that movie right. doesn't exist in the Miyagi-verse. So that song didn't exist in their universe before that moment. Uh, but it does get confusing because now there's two versions of that song in the Miyagi-verse. So uh, I leave it to the mathematicians to And they're both connect. And they're both connected to that tournament. So they think it's connected to you, but it's come from a different person. Right. <laughs> I worry sometimes that I overthink these things. <laughs> <laughs> so- we do a lot of thinking and overthinking ourselves. So it's a good trait. Absolutely. So the stunt team did an incredible job in season four, as they always do. Which were the most complicated scenes to film? I mean, there there were there were so many. I mean, the tournament itself is just such a immense undertaking. I mean, you have so many different fights going on, so many matches, uh, you know, and then there's the the fights in the background. Like when a main when a when a fight is happening, you see behind the fight there's another fight. So there's so many moving parts during the tournament, and so little time to prepare because they've been you know uh, preparing all sorts of other fights throughout the season. In addition to that, we had the skills competition, which was new for us. So each of the kids was learning uh, different weapons over the course of the season. Some like Mary Mauser, who were doing it from the very beginning of the season. Others were picking it up sort of a little bit closer to uh, to shooting time. Uh, so certainly that's what stands out the most. I mean, the Johnny Daniel fight was a big, uh, you know, there was a lot of focus on that because of what, uh, what it meant to the story, what it meant to the history of these characters. Uh, the hockey fight was a big challenge because our stunt team came on a little bit last minute and we, there were some scheduling uh, challenges. So th- th- they became, uh, they, they were sort of thrust into the fire real quickly and had to quickly put together that fight uh, with Ralph. And it's it immediately became one of our favorite fights of the series. The, the prom fight, I would say also, you know, oh, you're, yeah. you're next to a pool, you're on concrete mm-hmm. in bare feet. And um, I'm not, when I say you, I mean, I'm in a, I'm in a very warm jacket uh, eating a donut, but, um, but <laughs> the performers uh, are, you know, and there, and there's eight of them because, you know, you have four actors and four doubles and, you know, they're going in the water and it's late at night and, um, you know, and it's complicated because it's, you know, the, the tournament, at least and the Johnny Daniel fights, you have, it's one-on-one and it's tournament rules. So it's structured and there are clear breaks in the action. Um, when you have four people and you're mixing in dance choreography and you're next to water and it's freezing, um, you know, that that was, you know, a moment that was certainly challenging. That was you know amazing to be able to pull off. I think that Eli Hawke's been on a tremendous journey since the first season and finally losing his mohawk and getting to the, the final match. I felt like he was very much an underdog, but I think he really deserved that win after everything that he'd been through. And that's he found himself by losing what he thought was his identity. It was that that's the character that we've loved since day one. I remember uh, finding the right performer for that character was a huge challenge in the audition phase. We were, you know, the actors had to come in and they had to nail the Eli of it all and had to nail the Hawk of it all. And Jacob Bertrand blew us away then. And it's that's, you know, one of those stories that has developed over the course of our writer's room. You know, when we started Cobra Kai, um, you know, the big picture stuff and we still have, you know, thoughts as to where we end the series um, you know, you're mostly thinking about Johnny, Daniel, Kreese, the legacy characters and, and you know, Miguel and Robbie and Sam. Right. But, you know, some of these other characters like Hawk have become large characters in the story. And you find that story along the way as you're writing over the years um, to see the ups and downs that he's had over the seasons. And particularly in season four, you know, like you said, losing his identity, like Hawk was everything to him to like that. He felt like that was his power and to go back to basics and realize the person that he was before the Mohawk and the, and the, and the problems that, that, that new Hawk persona had. Um, And to overcome all that uh, was a fantastic arc for us. And it was great to see that, that battle between Hawk and Robbie, Jacob Bertrand and Tanner Buchanan are both, you know, that's them on screen, Mm -hmm. almost every single frame of that fight. 
They're amazing athletes. They're amazing competitors. Um, off camera, they love to compete as to who who's better. Uh, so it was really fun to have them square off. And really, the fight could have gone either way. Uh, but you know, from a story perspective, we loved giving Hawk the win there. Absolutely, and incidentally, they got some incredible height on their kicks. It's almost like they're in an anti gravity environment or something. Do you know who can jump the highest out of the cast? Those two are probably uh, two of the highest jumping people we have. I mean, Jacob can jump very high. Tanner can do flips. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a toss up. Um, we did have a wire uh, for one of the moves uh, in that fight, um, but that that big jump they do um, mm. where Jacob uh, where Hawk scores the point and they kind of meet in the middle and he kicks him and he falls. That's them. That's no wire. That's you know. That's just two. You know. <laughs> <laughs> limber, uh, athletic young man who can, um, you know, get some ups. I'd say Sila Austria may be the only other person who is in the mix there. She's uh, she plays Piper and yeah. she's uh, she's a gymnast by, by trade. So it's fun watching, uh, you know, her and um, Tanner, the two of them, like doing like, you know, flipping competitions and things like that in front of the all Valley crowd is really fun. Yeah. They're all amazing. And so Chris, really plays on Terry Silver's PTSD and how he owes a one and has to repay this debt for his entire life. Do you think that Chris deserves what happened to him in the finale? I, I think, mean, you added know, to Chris, that, the apple stealing as well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's all penance for the, for the apple stealing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, I, you know, Chris is uh, come up and says it's been a long time coming. You know, I think, you know, he came back into this universe and, you know, presented like a wolf in sheep's clothing to Johnny, you know, with that smile that he has at the end of uh, the first episode in season two, where, you know, he Johnny has kind of accepted his apology and you're not quite sure. Is it completely genuine? Is there an ulterior motive? And, you know, he ends up stealing Cobra Kai out from under Johnny. And, yeah, there's a philosophical difference between, you know, the way that they think that business should be run. But, you know, from there, he becomes kind of the the general of a you know a bunch of kids who are tormenting the valley uh so he's not exactly a character that's um you know that's without uh flaw <laughs> he's got he's got plenty of flaws plenty of reason to to go down the irony of you know the moment is that he's going down for something he didn't do um but and so that's so that was the the fun twist of that moment is that it's he's paying for somebody else's uh crime but uh but it felt like a moment that was the perfect poetry at the right time. He had just also shown that he's willing to grow for the first time that we've ever seen Crease on screen. You know, he's not giving the no mercy, sweep the leg, you know, speech at the tournament. He's telling his fighter, you know, to fight her fight, you know, the way that she thinks um, is, is right. And, you know, we, uh, we've never seen that side of Crease before. It felt like we finally had earned that through that relationship with Tori. And, you know, just when just when a character grows like that, that's usually the moment on this series that, uh, you know, their legs get kicked out from underneath them. So uh, you'll have to wait and see what happens <laughs> from there. Very exciting. Another returning character this year is Stingray or Stinkray, as his neighbors call him. Paul Waterhouse brought a lot of <laughs> comedy and humor to his role this season, but he also plays a massive part, obviously, in the final scenes too. One thing I wondered, though, is there a chance that his assault was actually caught on camera? Because I know there are security cameras at the dojo. You know, we can't speak to that, but we can speak to Paul Walter Hauser and his his amazing talents. I mean, this is a, a performer that the moment we saw him in the movie I, Tanya, we were like, we must work with him. We must write him into Cobra Kai. Mm -hmm. And the character of Stingray was born. Uh, you know, we had him in season two. We wanted him to be in season three, but he was busy overseas shooting Cruella the entire time. So he was unable to join us. But to bring him back in season four and to give him... Uh, you know, the wide range of emotions that, you know, Paul was able to deliver on screen to bring the big laughs and to have like, you know, match him up with PJ Byrne, who's another great comedic talent and have the two of them improving and being hilarious together and to give him that, you know, that his episode eight, this, his journey from, you know, excited to return to the dojo to being, you know, thrown out by crease and, feeling you see the genuine hurt on his face to you know bringing the trying to bring the party for these kids and to be humiliated by his neighbor and that to have that victory and to feel great and then for what happens with him 
it was uh, an actor like Paul Walter Hauser is who you need for that big story. And uh, we thought there was something really uh, fun and surprising to take this character who is traditionally used for comic relief, give him a little bit more gravitas and then have him involved in a giant plot point. Yeah, I love that. And there's another amazing scene at the end where Miguel and Johnny have this really moving and emotional moment. And then Johnny accidentally says the wrong name. Miguel decides he's going to go and find his dad in Mexico City. And obviously Johnny's going to be trying to find him. Do you think without, obviously we can't say what happens, but do you think they're headed towards some danger? I think, you know, we've, we've always presented, you know, Miguel's dad on this show as, you know, this bad guy. Um, and there's been some danger associated, you know, with him and, you know, sure, you know, any, any teenager who's running off to Mexico, I would say, you know, even if they're going to a, a resort town, um, there's some danger associated with just running away from home. Um, we know, you know, Robbie, you know, ran away and, you know, didn't have exactly a, an easy time, you know, when, when Daniel found him, he was dirty, his car had been stolen, you know, he was living on the streets. It's it's not a uh, easy experience when you just kind of make an impulsive decision to to up and run away. Um, so, you know, in terms of what's going to happen, you'll have to wait and see with season five. But um, but yeah, I think the you know it's easy to say that it's not smooth sailing. I can imagine. Did you, instantly, can you tell me? Did you film in Mexico City or somewhere else that looks a lot like it? Uh, we we ended up filming in Puerto Rico. Uh, right. We wanted to we wanted to film in Mexico. There were all sorts of challenges involving you know COVID restrictions. Yeah, of course. Uh, and uh, with with production, but uh, we filmed in Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, you know we we were there was a lot of uh, looking at images from Mex from Mexico City or, or and or uh, you know I'm not going to get into sp specifics about where in Mexico um, we may be in in uh, season five, but. Uh, there was, you know, looking at the imagery there, looking at the imagery in Puerto Rico and trying to be as authentic as we could be. And say so five minutes before season four debuted on Netflix, John, you tweeted, call it now. Who do you think is going to win the All Valley? And I replied, I think Cobra Kai is going to win. But I also think Yagi Do is going to get help from Chosen at the end. How did I do? You, 100%. Yeah, you, you got you nailed it. I don't I that's that's a that's a great call. The uh the chosen call was was especially impressive. Um but you you saw it. You, there was something that that you knew uh that most of the world didn't that, that uh I don't know how you pulled it off. What you tell us. I think I've just watched The Karate Kid and Cobra Kai too much. <laughs> There's never too much. Never too much. Keep watching. <laughs> I will. And I'm so excited to see Chosen back in a brand new environment. We've never seen him. And just the possibilities of interactions and possible fights he can get into with other senseis is really exciting. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Yeah, look, you can let your imagination run wild and uh, you can trust that we also are uh, excited about all of those things and uh, and approach season five with, uh, with that in mind. There's just, you know, anytime you you take a character that hasn't had exposure to a certain environment or to certain other characters, it, it presents endless opportunities uh, for, for what can happen. And, um, and I hope it uh, delivers on, you know, and, and overperforms people's expectations. Oh, you know, I know that the characters are in the best possible hands. So I'm just really excited to see what you cook up. Oh, thank you. We're excited. We love, we love this universe. We love the characters and especially when you get to bring back the legacy characters mm -hmm. and, uh, and show them in a whole new light. It's, it's so much fun. And can you both tell me what were your favorite scenes to work on in season four? Ooh, that's that's tough. I mean, you know, I, I, I directed the last two episodes, so I was just very in a micro way, you know, I was so, you know, tunnel visioned on the tournament. Um, because, you know, we had four cameras going at, you know, mostly every moment and, uh, and almost all of our cast on stage at the same time. So that kind of became its own little project um, for the last month or so uh, that, uh, you know, some days were more fun than others. Some days were just really, really hard work and you're, you're beating the clock. But when you're seeing things come together that, you know, achieve these awesome moments, such as Carrie Underwood, such as you know, the boys and girls finals. Um, it, and I mean, the, the most fun goosebump, you know, it was definitely the, um, the uh, cemetery with, with chosen because just, you felt that on the day, even without the music, 
just the there's something about visiting Mr. Miyagi's grave that it even though it's not real, <laughs> even though it's you know it's it's a you know a piece of set dressing that we bring to a you know to a cemetery and, and but the, it's 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 there's a little magic in the air at, at that location. Um, the, the leaves just do something different. The, you know, the sun came out on that day where it hadn't been out uh, in a while. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's different special days for different reasons, I guess. Yeah. For me, I would, I would say a lot of what we did um, with Terry Silver's return, um, you know, we had a long freezing cold shoot in Atlanta. So while there were so many special moments that we remember, it was, it was never comfortable. Um, the, the all Valley tournament was more comfortable because you're inside and it was awesome, but it was stressful and crazy, especially for Josh, who was directing that. Uh, but after we filmed all that, we went to Jacksonville, Florida, where we picked up all the, uh, the Malibu stuff. So, you know, things that you see in episode one, we were filming at the very end of our shoot and we finally had beautiful weather we're in a beautiful location you're filming terry silver and and uh sensei crease uh you know on a balcony talking about the events of karate kid three uh that was amazing having that whole party of um you know crease basically walking into this uh this like fancy kind of like hip gathering that's the last place you would expect uh, sensei crease to be in that was amazing. That's where we also filmed Johnny running on the beach, which was in episode five. Uh, so we, you know, that, that was fun. There, there were so many great memories of the things we were picking up there that, uh, that was awesome. And the one other thing that I will say that was one of my favorite moments, and I wasn't there on set for almost all of it, but, uh, the all Valley board meeting <laughs> when, the group, when you have that group, that, that's a, like one of our favorite things about the series are the the small recurring characters, those those characters that show up uh, that have been on the show before. And that All Valley Board group, we relate to them as a writer's room. We're trying to put on an awesome show like they're trying to put on an awesome show. So we love the minutia there and there and the comedy that was going on there and seeing those performers again. Uh, that was really fun and unique. And we, we don't get, you know, uh, some shows are, you know, blessed with having techno cranes all the time and, you know, it becomes old hat. So when we have a, a big techno crane move and we can, you know, really come from high to low or move around in a cantilevered way, uh, we we relish those opportunities. And I'll just say, like, Keith Arthur Bolden, uh, who plays Daryl, who's the MC of the tournament, anytime that crane did something cool and came up to his face, you know, for its karate time or, or moments like that, it just felt like amazing because you know you're you're moving the camera in a way that you know we don't always get to do. You're you're having a character that's completely you know a, a, a performer who's completely invested in their character and the universe, and uh, and that's that's the best part of making the show is that everybody really comes with a smile on their face and a uh, a reverence for the you know the source material of you know the original movies and. And it's fun. It's really fun to go to work with these people. Nobody's, you know, kind of yawning and phoning it in. And I love how there's so many still callbacks and quotes from the original movies and 80s pop trivia. Lots of love for Rocky this season. So I love that. And there's a bottle of wine that people may want to find out more about too, which I loved. What was your favorite Easter egg from season four? Hmm. They're all over the place. Yeah. yeah, I'd say the Cayman wine one is up there. Just, you know, you you brought that up and it was uh, Robert Mark Cayman is the guy who wrote the Karate Kid movies and many other great films. He owns yeah. a winery. So when we were going to have Terry Silver kick that bottle, uh, you know, that was one of the first uh, the first calls we made. We're like, you know, it's got to be Cayman wine. Um, another Easter egg that I love is um, at the uh, where we end up having the Eagle Fang uh, dojo, if, if you would call it a dojo. Uh, you know, it was Weber Industrial was what you saw on the sign, uh, you know, uh, on the wall in big letters. And in the initial script for Karate Kid, it was originally Daniel Weber as opposed to Daniel LaRusso. So that was sort of an Easter egg uh, that we put in big, bold letters. I like Johnny, you know, Johnny during his training tournament in episode five, he runs into the ocean. He starts beating up the waves. You know, he's, he's punching and kicking them. You know, he didn't see the Karate Kid, but, you know, in the Karate Kid, Daniel is approaching those waves with 
just pure balance, just trying to stand up and, you know, take the assault of the wave and be able to stand his feet. And it just, nothing, nothing shows the, you know, the two sides of the coin better than, you know, Johnny, like trying to kick a wave down. <laughs> and I think he did it too. He did a pretty good job. <laughs> he took on the ocean and won. Yeah. <laughs> After season four, can you both tell me which team are you both on? Are you Miyagi Day still? Are you Cobra Kai? Are you Eagle Fang? Are you Miyagi Fang? What is your allegiance? Uh, for me, the less I think the lesson of the season is it's good to get educated in a wide array of things. Yeah. Uh, whether it's your karate philosophies or just in life in general. Uh, that those who you know are open to knowledge um, are those who maybe find the greatest balance or have the the uh, biggest toolbox to to go through life. Uh, so I think you know for us, I think there's a little bit of uh, there's a certainly a lot of Miyagi Do in us in our everyday lives, and a little bit of Cobra Kai, and uh, certainly the flair of Eagle Fang is uh, what we try to live by. So uh, I think it's hard to pick a dojo and and firmly stay in one. I've been Topanga karate since <laughs> this whole time. Uh, yes. Yeah, just ride or die. Yeah. Completely understandable. <laughs> <laughs> I was so pleasantly surprised to hear that filming has already completed on season five. Can you tell me when it started and how long that, that process took? So we're wrapped... in post production right now. Yeah, we're in post right now. We wrapped season four in May. We uh, got into the writer's room for season five in July. Uh, and we started season five in September, I believe, right? It was, uh, yeah, September. And we, and we wrapped um, a couple days before Christmas. Um, so, you know, we ended up spending most of 2021 in production on two seasons of um, Cobra Kai, but we, we began and ended both seasons within that same calendar year. And can you tell me too, there's so many huge things that happen at the end of season four. Is it safe to assume that season five continues straight after season four? So there wouldn't be a time jump, for example. You know, it's, we never like to be specific about, uh, you know, where we're starting a season. Um, certainly a lot of big things happened at the end of the season, you know, Chosen's in town and, you know, Miguel is off looking for his father. Yeah. Uh, and uh you know, uh, the, it's just the aftermath of the tournament. So there's, uh, there's plenty, uh, plenty, uh, of stories that have urgency. So, you know, we certainly don't go too far, uh, beyond where, where we've been at the end of the season. Absolutely. And so I appreciate you probably can't answer this, but can we possibly expect a similar release pattern with season five at the end of the year, or could it come a bit earlier if it's done? We can guess um, just based on the last two seasons, but uh, we don't know. We don't have a um, a, a hard uh, release date, but we can um, likely suspect it'll be along the same pattern. Um, but until Netflix decides this is when it is, um, we, we wait in here as, as do other people. Indeed we do. <laughs> so here's something I wondered, having gone back and watched the original films, as I'm inclined to do. In Karate Kid 3, in order to recruit Mike Barnes, Terry Silver promises him 50% ownership of all new dojos, but he didn't clarify if it was dependent on him winning at the tournament. So my interpretation of that was that it wasn't, and he would just get 50% of all new dojos going forwards. Was that your interpretation too? We can't get into our, our... is a it's an interesting number. You know, it's it's you know that that character is is one that we get asked about all the time. You know, you know when will he come back? Will he come back? Um, you know, we can't answer any of that. Um, I know this but, is just about Karate Kid three. No, but I know, but in Karate Kid three, you know, it's I I'd always assumed it was tied into a victory. Um, right. That you know there was something there, but you know I, I also never got to look at that contract. <laughs> and you know it's possible that you know if he had a, a decent uh, you know a, attorney drawing it together or at least reviewing it on his side that uh, it would have included, um, you know, the, the caveat that, you know, as long as he's taking this on, he gets it no matter what. Absolutely. And so when season two concluded, it heavily hinted that Ali would return in season three. And likewise, at the end of season three, it was heavily hinted that Terry Silver might be in season four. The biggest takeaway for me this time was that Terry's old friends may be coming back. And the most well known of these is, of course, Mike Barnes, Sean Kanan. Now, I know you can't confirm either way if he's in there, but would you say that after holding back a bit in season four, that Cobra Kai will be a lot more aggressive in season five? 
season five, we get to see Terry Silver's vision fully realized. This is, uh, you know, he said he's expanding. Uh, you know, the 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 senseis who uh, oppose him, you know, Johnny's off in the wind. And we know that Daniel is not giving up. Uh, but, you know, uh, Terry, in his mind, probably thinks that he is, given the deal that they had made. Um, but yeah, season season five, you see Terry Silver and he has his resources and he has his uh, drive and he has his vision. So uh, we'll get to see exactly what that is going into you know, when you're watching season five. And, and while we can't, you know, confirm uh, anything, I can give you the, the, the Hayden Schlossberg favorite answer that, you know, if, if you like, you know, characters like, you know, Snake, and if you like characters like Dennis, and if you like characters like, you know, Mike Barnes, Cobra Kai is probably your best opportunity to maybe see those characters show up, you know, versus another show versus watching, you know, like a you know, NCIS or something like that. They're probably more likely to show up on our series uh, if they're going to. So you just Barnes, have to- Bar- Wait, Barnes, but Barnes showed up on Grey's Anatomy last season. That's Didn't true. He, there was a big Barnes true. arc on that. Yeah. They did that big Barnes arc. He <laughs> owns 50% of the Chicago uh, hospitals now as a result. Also, incidentally, Sean Kanan has recently been on the Sarah O'Connell show too. Hi, I'm Sean Kanan. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell show. So the first place to possibly look for him is, of course, Cobra Kai. <laughs> there Second you go. Place, Sarah O'Connell show. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Never know where to find him. Is it like a UK spinoff? Very unofficial. <laughs> so this question is completely unrelated to Cobra Kai, as was my Karate Kid 3 question. But have you ever met or spoken to Hilary Swank at all? We can't confirm or deny that we've spoken to <laughs> Hilary Swank or anybody who hasn't yet shown up on the show, only because, you know, we, we keep everything close to our vest. You know, I, I will say we've we've communicated and met, you know, Almost everybody still alive um, that has, you know, been in the original um, trilogy. You know, we were yeah. fortunate to do a reunited apart with Josh Gad um, last year and, that, that. you know, bring back so many, you know, performers and behind the scenes, you know, from, you know, Joe Esposito, you know, did do the best around, you know, we've been, we've been, it's thrilling to be in the fandom and to be, you know, in, in charge of this, um, this universe right now, because we get to meet all the people uh, that are part of it and we get to work with, uh, with some of them as well, but, uh, we, we can't say, you know, whether we've, uh, we've, we've met or have not met or have talked or have not talked. <laughs> of course. But I had to ask you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say we're huge fans of Hillary Swank. We know that. Absolutely. You know, we love her, her entire career and loved her performance in yeah. uh, the next Friday kid. Absolutely. Same. And another thing I must ask you too, will we ever find out at any point in the future what is written on that Miyagi Day scroll? Or do I have to learn Japanese? <laughs> I think we need to learn Japanese as well. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know I, uh, it, it's possible, you know, we have the scroll there, you know, it's, it's made its way uh, to America. It's made its way in the hands of, uh, of the LaRussos. Will it come into play later on? You know, you have to keep watching the show to find out. So I wouldn't ever ask you if Hillary Swank is returning or if Sean Kanan is going to be in the show. But one person I would like to directly ask you is, will Randy Heller be returning as Lucille Luiso? Because I absolutely love her. She's a big anchor to the original movies. And is there any chance we might see her again? She's great. We, yeah, we've seen her in multiple seasons and we love Randy, uh, you know, coming to set and, you know, continuing to play uh, the, the matriarch of, uh, of the LaRusso family. And uh, perhaps there's more story to tell there. You'll have to stay tuned. But um, but it's a thrill whenever she comes to set because she just brings such a, an energy and a connection Um you know, to that original movie. Completely agree. And so sometimes when shows or indeed movies are shrouded in mystery and secrecy as Cobra Kai is and should be, sometimes, for example, with the new Spider-Man movie, fans find out things in advance when merchandise is released, bit t-shirts or Lego or whatever it is. And so obviously there's been a massive leak from season five. <laughs> <laughs> we, when those toys showed up, we were, yeah. we were very disturbed. We're, you know, <laughs> to, to have a spoiler like that just out there in a major way and for, you know, these toy companies to be capitalizing on it, it's, it's messed we up. We have to rewrite the ending, but, um, you know, I can say, you know, Splinter is no longer um, in the season as a result. Very sorry to hear that, but I hope that his spirit and memory lives on. <laughs> <laughs> 
And incidentally, speaking of the Ninja Turtles, that's not the only potential 80s crossover because I also happen to find this, which I don't know if you've seen this before, but it's spectacular. That, that, I, have not, I have not seen that, and that is amazing. That's great. Right? Stay Puft Marshmallow Man doing the crane kick. It's officially licensed somehow. Well, that's it's amazing. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's Sony properties, right? Yeah, I, yeah, have, very, Sony, I yeah. have very tasteful artwork in my house. I, I can tell. I see, uh, I see, I see Chris, Chris, Chris Kringle. Chris Kringle all year round. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's a good luck charm. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to have Chris in your house. It's very it wards true. off other, other evil. <laughs> I find that. And I was delighted recently to see a Fortnite crossover with Cobra Kai as well. That must have been a lot of fun. Have you had the chance to play the game with those characters? I still have to play uh, the game because we've been so busy. We just got out of production and just, you know, got thrown right into post. Uh, But, you know, we started having those discussions with Fortnite, you know, almost a year before that came out, just so they could start thinking about it and wrapping their brains around it and, um, discussing the ways that uh, that they could fold into that universe. And uh, they've been great, you know, partners in terms of looking at this IP from the show as it, you know, touches other things in a way that this doesn't feel gratuitous. Um, and, you know, it felt like they were already doing so much of that with other materials that, you know, why not jump in with both feet? Johnny Lawrence is well known to be an excellent chef from shredded wheat to frying various meats to making sandwiches. He really can do it all. Would you ever consider releasing a Cobra Kai cookbook with recipes from the valley and Okinawa, perhaps? Uh, yes, we hadn't considered idea. it up until now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you have a if you have a book proposal, uh, we'll, we'll reach out to the team at Sony. But uh, I yeah. think that, you know, I think maybe it is called for. I'd like to see Louis LaRusso's Sunday sauce. That's what I want to eat. I want to exactly. see that that chicken cacciatore that uh, that Zarkarian was double dipping in. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I want to see all the things. <laughs> so I'll go away and I'll put together a proposal. I've got some spare time, so I'll think up some recipes and things. And <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that's that great. Come, so... right? And <laughs> there'll be a whole section on beer, I think. Uh, beer plays a big part in Cobra Kai. <laughs> yeah, it's just bad beer. Meat and beer, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> And so, of course, season five isn't out yet, but season six is, of course, a possibility. Can you tell me when it's perhaps going to be filming or when you might be getting around to doing that? Um, we're not at that stage yet. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully get, you know, positive word uh, from the team at Netflix that we're going to be doing another season. Um, you know, we have a few other things that we're, we're juggling on our plates right now, uh, including another show that we're, we're prepping for right now. Uh, not, not something that we're not able to uh, speak to at the moment, but hopefully soon. Uh, so uh, we don't know exactly when we'll, we'll be filming another season of Cobra Kai, but we have in our minds a loose plan. And uh, if it becomes uh, a reality, then, uh, you know, the, you know, hopefully we'll be able to answer that question at some point. And so I was delighted to hear that Andrew Garfield is a huge fan of Cobra Kai. And of course you filmed season five already, but if the stars ever aligned, would you love to bring him in for a cameo or any kind of part in the show? Certainly. Yeah. He can play, you know, young Dugan who's you know, Michael Ironside's character oh. from uh, the next Karate Kid. We, you know, <laughs> do a whole flashback where, <laughs> and by the way, that might be real. You never know. But uh, but yeah, no, it would be a thrill to work with Andrew. We're, we're huge fans of his work. You know, I just saw Tick Tick Boom a couple of weeks ago, which was incredible. Um, but uh, it, it's it, it's nice to work with people who love what they're working on and bring that energy with them. And, um, you know, the, the fact that he's such a super fan of this you know franchise as we are is a great place to start. Have you mapped out how you think the show might eventually end? Do you have it locked in a, a safe somewhere? Do you feel like the story is kind of wrapping up over the next couple of seasons or is the Miyagi verse only just getting started with prequels and sequels and spinoffs and perhaps more movies in the future? I mean, in our minds, the Miyagi verse is just getting started. We do yeah. have a vision for where um, you know, this particular uh Cobra Kai story is going to end. Mm. Uh, you know, we can't speak to exactly how many seasons it will be. Uh, mm. Those are ongoing discussions that we're having with the teams at Sony and, and Netflix, but we have in our heads kind of where it's headed. But we think about a wide array of things in, in the Miyagi verse, some in active development, others are just kernels right now. But uh, this is a world uh, that we love playing in. And Clearly, the uh, the audience enjoys, you know, being in this universe as well as we know you do. 
Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's uh, the themes and vibes that this franchise brings, uh, you know, I think are timeless. So, uh, you know, we'll just see where, where the future takes us. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing that myself. And so I thought I'd look at some of the fan theories that are coming out around online. And one thing that always keeps coming up and it's so funny and it's related to tons of different characters. One of the main theories seems to be that Chris is Johnny's dad and Mike Barnes is Tori's dad. So my question to you, though, is this. Will this ever get settled on an episode of Jerry Springer in Cobra Kai in future seasons? Is there going to be a DNA test? It's it's not shocking that these theories exist because, you know, our show is inherently soapy. And, you know, those are very soap opera, you know, cliche type of, you know, ideas that, oh, my God, dun, 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 someone's alive, dun, 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 you know, someone's someone's father. They're all um, related. I, yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty clear, you know, in the karate kid, you know, that Kreese is not Johnny's dad, but, uh, and I, I think it's pretty clear in our series that Kreese is not Johnny's dad, but if he ends up being Johnny's dad, that'll be a hell of a twist. Um, and you know, whether Mike Barnes is Tori's dad, that's, uh, that's an interesting theory, you know, again. Um, but, um, you know, you'll have to wait and see, I guess, if, uh, on that one. I think the the big twist at the end should be Ralph Macho reveals what his real age was when he entered the under eighteen tournament, and he shouldn't have been in it in the first place. <laughs> Stripped of all his titles. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, it's funny. I was watching him. Uh, he was on Fallon a night or two ago. Yeah. And I, as he walked out there, even I, who know I know him, I've spent a lot of time with him. I was just like, it, it's ridiculous how young he looks. It looks like he's thirty eight years old. Yeah, it's ridiculous. He does. Yeah. yeah. Most unnecessary. I don't know how he does it. I think because he has that headband on all the time, he just doesn't wrinkle. (laughs) I think that might be it. (laughs) It holds everything up. (laughs) (laughs) It's an old fashioned facelift, just really (laughs) tight at the back there. (laughs) And can you tell me anything else you might be working on in 2022? Yeah, we have this show that John mentioned that we can't really talk about yet, but uh, it's going to be a very big one. Um, And you know, hopefully soon we'll be able to, uh, to speak, you know, about that, um, because, uh, it's, it's going to happen. Um, and, uh, we have, <laughs> we have two or three other things we also can't talk about. It's funny, you know, we are very, very busy right now, um, you know, doing things both in and out of the Miyagi verse, um, and until we get the, the nod and the go ahead to, uh, to speak to some of the things, these things, we, we have to kind of keep them under our hat. But uh, we are in post production and um, and mm. writing at the same time. Well, I can't wait to see everything that you're working on. And my final question is: this, Have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connor Show and your fans around the world? I mean, the big message is that we appreciate the love and support of of our show. Um, you know, we've been talking with Sarah since uh, season one. Uh, and, you know, felt the love of the Karate Kid and the work that we've been doing on the show. Uh, not the two of us, our third part, our third musketeer, Hayden, uh, and uh, the entire cast and crew, we love what we're doing. We love uh, making the show. We love uh, the messages behind the show. Um, you know, we, we sought out to make a show for everybody, for whether you're a, a seven-year-old or a 70-year-old. It doesn't matter what country you live in or if you're uh, you know, uh, whatever background you have, uh, we're, we're making a show that hopefully speaks to you in one way or another. So we appreciate the continued support. Uh, keep watching Cobra Kai and uh, keep watching the Sarah O'Connell show. You know, when you got on an airplane, you know, they, they sometimes would say, you know, you, we know you have choices and thank you for choosing this airline, but, but that's nonsense. You don't really have a choice. You know, it's usually there's one airplane that's having the nonstop flight from, you know, your city to the other city at the right time of day. So there's no choice. You have to fly this airplane. But, you know, right now I read an article this morning that there's something, there's never been more active series um, on the air at the same time in history than there are right now. There's like 550 something like active shows that are still in production, making new episodes, not to mention the, you know, the cacophony of everything else that's available that's ever been you know, out in the world, that's all available at your fingertips. Um, so to to have any audience is a gift. To have you know a passionate fan base is you know uh, is just love. And to experience a huge audience who's also passionate is just overwhelming. And uh, we couldn't be 
you know, happier about it. We couldn't be happier to be part of this fandom and we couldn't be more thrilled to, to make more. Well, Josh Hild, John Harris, thank you so much for coming back on my show. I really love chatting about Cobra Kai season four. Congratulations on its huge, well-deserved success. Thanks thank so you much, so Sarah. much, Sarah. Thanks to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye.